<laughs> Good morning. Cliff said he'd bring this out for me, so I was giving him a minute to do that. So, I'm Phil Schmunk, and it's so good to see you here this morning. How are you? Yay! I hope you feel that way after I'm done talking. <laughs> so, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. You maybe don't know me. I uh, had the privilege of being the pastor here for about five years before Mitch, and i uh, so thankful for Mitch. He's done such a wonderful job. Uh, what a wonderful pastor he is. And uh, I retired. I actually, I've retired a bunch of times, uh, and I still haven't figured it out. But right now, I am the chaplain at Venice Christian School, and we don't even know what that means for sure. But it has something to do with raising funds because I know all the pastors in town and the school is an amazing place and uh, we can have 500 students, but we don't have room for 500 students. So we're doing some building and we're, we've got a project that's about an $8 million project. So now you know how to pray for us. Uh, and if you want to give to the school, you're welcome to do that. Um, and in the fall, I'm also going to be teaching Bible because uh, I know something about that. So uh, I'm excited to be there. It's a privilege to be on staff at Venice Christian School. And uh, here's another thing about me you maybe didn't know. I am working on writing a book. My brother started this book. He actually had a book or two published, and he asked me if I wanted to go in with him on this book. Uh, the title is Jesus Never Said That. And so it's a bunch, there you go. Uh, a bunch of things that uh, we assume about Jesus. And the, the goal of this book is to come up with an accurate understanding of Jesus, to get to know him and what he really said. And I, this morning, I want to walk you through some of those. I uh, have 21 chapters in this book that I worked on with my brother. By the way, my brother went to be with the Lord a few years ago, and I'm trying to finish this kind of in his honor. And... Um, so I have uh, 21 chapters that I've written and another 80 uh, chapters that I've outlined, which I don't think I'm going to end up writing that much. I think I'm pretty much done. But now I've decided uh, not only to write the chapters, but I'm illustrating the chapters with my own art. So uh, I'm not a great artist, but I do like to draw. So um, I'm in the process of doing all that. And so I thought this morning I would walk you through some of my thoughts about that. See, here's the problem. Uh, people assume things. They assume that Jesus said certain things which he didn't say. And uh, it gets them in trouble. And so the goal is to get to know Jesus better. And uh, my hope is that what, what I'm going to really focus on at the end of our time together is this idea that Jesus never said somebody has to be sorry before you can forgive them. So we're going to talk about that at the end. But uh, one of the first chapters I wrote uh, is on this idea uh, that Jesus never said that he hated sinners. Jesus never said God hated sinners. And uh, I think a lot of people have this picture of God stomping on sinners. And that's not the case at all. In fact, Jesus was known as a friend of sinners. And I have often thought to myself, I want to be part of a church that's known as a friend of sinners. Now, we don't want to wink at sin, right? We don't want to say sin's okay. But people are loved by God. And we want to love people. And so I would hope that this church, I think it is, known as a church that loves people. Uh, so Jesus never said, I hate sinners. And uh, scripture's pretty clear about this. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him would not perish, would have everlasting life. God loved us so much. And this is one of the things you've probably heard me say, if you've heard me talk very much. Uh, God's not sending people to hell. We're going on our own. And the thing is, it's like we're on the train track and the train is coming. And God is saying with all his being, get off of the track. And of course, we don't very easily get off the track. And so here's what he did. He took his own son and he threw him in front of the train for us uh, because he loves us that much. That's incredible. That's incredible that God would love us like that. And so uh, God 
uh, doesn't say that he hates sinners because if God hated sinners, he'd have to hate everyone, <laughs> right? Because you and I are sinners. I, did you know that? Uh, take that home with you. <laughs> we, we tend to uh, think that we're okay, but we are loved by God. He loves us. That's amazing. And he wants us to know him. Uh, here's another chapter I wrote. Uh, Jesus never said, I just want you to be happy. Uh, primarily because there's enormous difference between happiness and joy. Uh, I learned a song when I was a kid, so I'm going to sing to you. Are you ready? Okay. Jesus and others and you, what a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus and others and you, in the life of each girl and each boy. J is for Jesus, for he has First place, O, is for others you meet face to face. Y is for you and whatever you do. Put yourself last and spell joy. That was way off tune, I'm sorry, but... Uh, <laughs> Jesus and others and you is how you spell joy. So God doesn't want us to be happy because here's what I learned early on. Happiness is based on what happens, right? We can't control what happens. And God doesn't want to control what happens in our life. He, but he wants us to have joy. Joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Did you know that? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness. Uh, and the fruit of the Spirit is not a private garden, but it is a farmer's market. And God wants us to experience joy. And so in James 1, 2, uh, Scripture says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face various trials. Uh, knowing that the tempting of your face develops perseverance, right? So uh, God wants us to have joy. He, he doesn't want us to not necessarily to be happy, although joy makes us happy, but he wants us to have joy. So that was one of the things we misunderstand about Jesus. Uh, people say, I'm not happy. What's wrong, God? <laughs> right? Well, life happens, right? But you can have joy in the midst of trials. Uh, the third thing that I made into a chapter is uh, Jesus never said, you will never wonder about my actions. Okay, because God does stuff that we wonder about. And if you were stuck in a wheelchair, I think you would wonder, God, why me? You know, um, uh, we have a, this thing about wanting all good to happen to us and life's not like that. And, but I don't think we need to blame Jesus for this. Uh, because even though God is knowable, he and his actions may be unfathomable to us. So if I knew everything God knew, I'd be on the same level as him. We know that's not true. Uh, Joseph Cook said this in 1881. If, uh, even though God is knowable, his actions may be unfathomable to us. Uh, and so... Uh, Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in all the earth. And so tough things happen, and we struggle with that. This is going to fit in with our thinking about forgiveness, because uh, tough things happen to us. And we have a hard time forgiving people who are connected to those difficult experiences in our life. Uh, my son Daniel died when he was 21. And uh, I had a meltdown, a spiritual meltdown. And I remember pulling the car over and saying, God, this is not fair. I mean, Daniel loved you. Uh, he was going to be an amazing man. And you took him and look at all of these jerks that you let live, right? Uh, why do you take the good and let the bad go on? And I struggled with that a lot, quite honestly. But I finally came to the conclusion that God is good. He's always good. And I can trust him. And so when life is tough, I come back to this. God is good. He's always good. And I can trust him. There's a story told. I'm not sure I should tell this in church, but I'm going to anyway. Um, this old crotchety old man, uh, kind of a disbelieving know-it-all guy, said to this little girl, uh, why does everybody believe in God, because why do we think he created the universe and uh, the world's so complicated and how can we give God all the credit like that? And, and she said, well, let me ask you a question, sir. 
She said, when a rabbit um, poops, it's little pellets. And when a, a cow poops, we call that a cow pie, and that's a, like a big thing. And when horses poop, it's like muffins. We call them road apples. And she says, why is it all so different? And he says, you're a very thoughtful little girl. He says, I have no idea. She said, well, sir, maybe you shouldn't be so self-righteous and knowing it all about God, because it's very clear you don't know crap. <laughs> I don't know, should I tell that in church? <laughs> but the truth is, there's a lot we don't know, and we love to blame God for things. But God is good. He is always good. And we can trust him. I did another chapter on uh, faith, a little bit about faith. Uh, Jesus never said, uh, your, your quantity of faith determines the outcome. And some people are very committed to things that are not, Insane. So this guy has on his shirt, I have faith I can fly. So he's jumped out a window. Uh, he's got faith, but uh, maybe his faith is in the wrong thing because the question is not how much faith do you have, but what is your faith in? And so uh, I have a, a, I love acrostics, I love words. And faith stands for forsaking all, I trust him. And you need to place your faith in Christ. Hebrews 11.1, 1. faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. And so uh, a lot of times in the church, I've had people say, well, just have enough faith, you know? And yeah, we need to be people full of faith, but we've got to place our faith in the right things. And so don't get mad at God when things don't turn out that you have placed your faith in inappropriately. Uh, Jesus never said that money is the root of all evil. So you know that, right? What he said is in 2 Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And uh, he also goes on to say, it's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. So uh, it's loving things that aren't appropriate for us to love. We need to be loving people, but don't love money. Money is not going to answer all your problems. In fact, it may create some for you. Uh, so uh, Jesus didn't say money is the root of all evil. He said the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's okay to have money, but love the Lord your God with all your heart. Um, I also had a chapter on success. Uh, Jesus never said you need to be successful. Now, maybe you will be successful, and that's wonderful, but the idea of success is so easily misunderstood. Success often means spending money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like. And that's, uh, that's the wrong way for us to go in our lives. Uh, so Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Uh, I want to challenge you, if you don't have a personal commitment to read scripture, you need to be doing this. Uh, scripture is where we find truth. Scripture is where we find direction and hope. It's how we get to know the Lord. He teaches us about himself through his word. And I try to read through the Bible every year. I pick a different translation every year. It gives me a little different slant on things. And uh, I'm in the process of reading through scripture now. I'm, I think I'm in 1 Corinthians and Ezra. And uh, i Every time I read through, I go, wow, I never saw that before. Uh, oh, how does that work? <laughs> you know, and I spend a lot of time in prayer and wonder, and God is good. And uh, I encourage you to be people of the word. Uh, and that's how you're going to find success. Success is uh, found in knowing and interacting with God. Uh, here's another thing that I threw in there just because I could. Jesus never said, when you die, you become an angel. 
Uh, so how many of you have ever met an angel? Oh, you're supposed to say, met one, I married one. <laughs> right? Uh, and so I got to apologize for this picture. I have heard that there's no scripture that says angels have wings. So I don't know if angels have wings or not. Uh, but ne Jesus never said when you die, you become an angel because angels are a completely different category of creation than human beings. Uh, they were created by God before we were. Uh, angels long to look into who God is. Uh, there is a lot of things about angels that are wonderful, but we are not angels. We are humans. Um, scripture says one day the saints will judge the angels. So very interesting. Uh, Psalm 8, 5, you have made them, human beings, a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. And so Jesus never said, when you die, you become an angel. Uh, I just think that's interesting. <laughs> Are you still with me? If you're with me, raise your hand. Yay! Okay. Uh, you thought I said raise your hand, but what I said is, if you're with me, give me $10. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I am blessed. So here's uh, number nine, and then I'll get into our sermon for the day. Ah. Uh, number nine is, uh, Jesus never said, I will give you whatever you want. Um, because sometimes our desires are not honoring to God. And what we want, our, our, our interests in things, is not where God wants us to go. Um, so... Philippians 4.19, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And uh, here's an interesting thing. Jesus said on the cross, Father, or he was going to the cross, uh, Father, all things are possible for you, but not my will, your will be done. And uh, I wonder if that's the way we live our lives. Lord, I, I have some things I'm hopeful for, but I, I want to do your will. I, I want your will to be done in my life. So whatever it takes, Lord, uh, do your will. So Jesus never said, uh, I'll give you everything you want. Um, so here's our sermon for the day. <laughs> Jesus never said, you do not have to forgive people who are not sorry. And I want to just quickly talk about a few uh, elements of this. Uh, number one, I'm, I'm telling you stuff that you already know. So I get that. I'm, this is not new to you. But we know that we should be forgiven, right? We know that we should be forgiving people. And uh, that's, that's not news to you. Uh, sometimes something happens and forgiveness is difficult for us. But here's the point I want to get to. Will you decide to forgive people this morning? So... Uh, it's an important question about whether we forgive people even if they're not sorry, uh, because it's tremendously practical. Uh, if you work to faithfully apply the words of Jesus, then you will likely encounter people who will not repent, who will not ask for forgiveness, or even seem like they've done anything wrong. Have you met those people? Maybe they're sitting next to you. I don't know. Maybe they're in your family. Uh, they do crazy things, and they just act like it's nothing. And it's a little bit infuriating when people do things that are wrong and they don't seem to even care and they do them to you and they're wrong and they kind of want you to love them anyway. And it's like, wait a minute, you hurt me. And uh, that's, that's hard. Uh, I had a situation where I was doing a job I really liked and somebody... Uh, my supervisor came along and she started talking to me about this other person and whether they would do my job well. And I'm assuming she's going to bring them in to work with me. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm a great person. I, I think they're really, you know, on top of it. And so she put that other person in my place and fired me. And that was really hard for me to take because I was doing something that I really loved. And it took me a while to be unforgiving about that. And that's the thing. Uh, life is going to throw you a curve every once in a while. And here's the question I want to ask you. 
is are you willing to be the forgiving person or are you going to take it and hold it uh, in anger in your life, which is not healthy? Here's a couple scriptures that you ought to be aware of. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he uh, may have something to give and share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give a Uh, grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption let all bitterness and wrath and anger and calm or slander be put away from you along with all malice be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you Um, It's hard to be like Jesus, okay? He's God. (laughs) So we get that. But he's our model. And here's the thing about Jesus that's so amazing. Not only did he come to save us, uh, to forgive us our sins, but he uh, dealt with religious people in a very interesting way. He just told them the truth. Uh, I'm going to confess to you I'm not religious, I don't want to be religious. I want to be faithful. Uh, There's some things with religion that really bother me. I have a friend who goes to a church where they have to sign a thing to be a member of the church that says, I will not partake of any alcohol. Now, I don't drink alcohol at all anyways, so I shouldn't care about this. But I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. Would Jesus have turned water into wine if alcohol was bad? And would he use alcohol as a symbol of his blood shed for us if alcohol was bad? I just don't get it. And I think those of us who are religious tend to get religion all messed up. And uh, I I just, uh, I want to be like Jesus. And uh, there's a passage, let me read this for you in Luke 23. Uh, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, Golgotha, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, (laughs) could we be like Jesus in this regard? Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they're doing. Uh, And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one, let him come down from the cross. How amazing is it that the God of the universe, who had all power and all authority, would say about people who were spitting on him and hurting him, I don't think you and I can imagine the pain that Jesus went through on the cross for you and me. He paid the penalty of our sin and purchased a place for us in heaven. And he had the power to say, enough of this, I'm done. And have you ever sung that song? He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. And more than that, uh, the power he had And yet he forgave people their sin and he died in their place. The very people who were crucifying him, he died for them and he died for you and me. And he knew how to forgive people. You and I need to know how to forgive people. And um, forgiveness is really hard because it really hurts. Uh, We often withhold forgiveness because we were truly hurt. Uh, What that other person did was wrong. It'll always be wrong. And you're not saying that what happened is okay. uh, But uh, we need to be able to say, forgive them, Lord. And here's an interesting thing. The word forgiveness has this word in it, give, right? You got to give of yourself to somebody 
who's hurt you. Um, we equate forgiveness with approval of sin, I know, and we don't want to wink at sin, and we don't want to let sin go by. Uh, so we feel like somebody's got to be held accountable for what they did, right? And especially if they hurt us. And we don't want to forgive them. Uh, we withhold forgiveness because we don't want to send the message that we approve of sin. Uh, and this word forgiveness has give right in the middle of it. Forgiveness is going to cost you something, and are you willing to demonstrate kindness to others who have hurt you? And so uh, we've all been hurt. Uh, we know we should be forgiving, but here's the point I want to make. And I said all of that to say this. Will you let go of the struggle that you're having with that person, with that group of people, with those in your life that have hurt you. And will you love them? We love them the way Jesus does, uh, so much so that he would jump in front of the train that's gonna hit us. Uh, would you be willing to be that person who says, uh, ouch, but you know what, I love you. And I'm not gonna let this be a barrier between us and I forgive you. And not because I'm so great, but because I have a Savior who is forgiving and he forgave me. Uh, this morning, uh, did you realize that God loves you? And he's forgiven you all the crazy stuff you've ever done. And all you got to do is accept his forgiveness. And so I invite you this morning to let go of the anger, the struggle, and... Place your faith in Jesus. God bless you.